here for, um, really nice to not even see you, to speak to you actually, and I thought it would be a, a nice thing to do to read to you each day. Now, as Lime Class know, um, I have been harping on about this book all year, and we were meant to be reading it in the summer term, so after Easter, so I thought, well, why don't we make a start on it, and then hopefully we get to finish it together, um, but uh, if not, then we'll finish it on here. Um, but it's called Journey to the River Sea, and it's by an author called Eva Ibbotson, and I've not actually read of any of her other books, but I really, really enjoy this. Um, and it's a lovely book. I know some of you have been reading it already. Um, so if you have got a copy of it at home and you'd like to read along, that would be really lovely. Um, but if not, you can just hopefully enjoy me reading it to you. But obviously, I'm not going to do it on my own. Now, there was a little someone who did not want to be isolating in that classroom on his own. And so I had to bring him home with me. So here's Mozzie. He's at home with me. And we're isolating together, aren't we, Moz? Um, so there we go. He's going to enjoy our story together. Aren't we, Moz? Okay, make sure you're listening. Um, so, let's get started. Now, chapter one. It was a good school, one of the best in London. Miss Banks and her sister Emily believed that girls should be taught as thoroughly and as carefully as boys. They'd, been, they'd bought three houses in a quiet square, a pleasant place with plain trees and well-behaved pigeons, and put up a brass plate saying the Mayfair Academy for Young Ladies. And they'd prospered. For while the sisters prized proper learning, they also prized good manners, thoughtfulness, and care for others. And the girls learnt both algebra and needlework. Moreover, they took in children whose parents were abroad and needed somewhere to spend the holidays. Now, some 30 years later... In the autumn of 1910, the school had a waiting list, and those girls who went there knew how lucky they were. All the same, there were times when they were very bored. Miss Carlyle was giving a geography lesson in the big classroom which faced the street. She was a good teacher, but even the best teachers have trouble trying to make the rivers of southern England seem unusual and exciting. Now, can anyone tell me the exact source of the River Thames? she asked. She passed her eyes along the rows of desks. Missed the plump Hermione, the worried-looking Daisy, and stopped by a girl in the front row. Don't chew the end of your pigtail, she was about to say, but she didn't say it, for it was a day when this particular girl had a right to chew the end of her single heavy plait of hair. Maya had seen the motor stop outside the door, had seen old Mr Murray in his velvet-collared coat go into the house. Mr Murray was Maya's guardian, and today, as everyone knew, he was bringing her news about her future. Maya raised her eyes to Miss Carlyle and struggled to concentrate. In the room full of fair and light brown heads, she stood out with her pale triangular face, her widely spaced dark eyes, her ears laid bare by the heavy rope of black hair, gave her an unprotected look. The Thames rises in the Cotswolds hills, she, uh, she began in her low, clear voice. In a small hamlet, only what small hamlet, she had no idea. The door opened and twenty heads turned. Would Maya Fielding please come to Mrs Banks' room, said the maid. Maya rose to her feet. Fear is the cause of all evil, she told herself, but she was afraid, afraid of the future, afraid of the unknown, afraid in the way of someone who was alone in the world. Miss Banks was sitting behind her desk. Her sister, Miss Emily, stood beside her. Mr Murray was in a leather chair by a table, rustling papers. Mr Murray was Maya's guardian, but he was also a lawyer and he never forgot it. Things had to be done carefully and slowly and written down. Maya looked round at the assembled faces. They looked cheerful, but that could mean anything, and she bent down to pat Mrs Banks' spaniel, finding comfort in the feel of his round, warm head. Well, Maya, we have good news, said Miss Banks, a frightening woman to many. Now in her sixties, with an amazing bust which will have done splendidly on the prow of a sailing ship. She smiled at the girl standing in front of her, a clever child and a brave one, who had fought hard to overcome the devastating blow of her parents' death in a train crash in Egypt two years earlier. The staff knew how Maya had wept night after night under her pillow, trying not to wake her friends. If good fortune was to come her way, there was no one who deserved it more. We found your relatives. Miss Banks went on. And will they? Maya began, but she couldn't finish. Mr Murray took over now. They're willing to give you a home. Maya took a deep breath. 
Oh, she'd spent her holidays for the past two years in the school. Everyone was friendly and kind, but a home. Not only that, said Miss Emily, but it turns out the Carters have twin daughters about your age. She smiled broadly and nodded as though herself. She herself had arranged the birth of the twins for Maya's benefit. Mr Murray patted the large folder on his knee. As you know, we've been searching for a long time for anyone related to your late father. We knew there was a second cousin, a Mr Clifford Carter, but all efforts to trace him failed until two months ago. When we heard that he'd emigrated six years earlier, he'd left England with his family. Mm, so where is he now? Maya asked. There was a moment of silence. It was as though the good news had now run out and Mr Murray looked solemn and cleared his throat. He's living... <clears throat> the Carters are living on the Amazon. In South America and Brazil, put in Miss Banks. Maya lifted her head. On the Amazon, she said. In a jungle, do you mean? Not exactly. Mr Carter is a rubber planter. He's her house on the river, not far from the city of Manaus. It's a perfectly civilised place. I have, of course, arranged for the consul out there to visit it. He knows the family and they're very respectable. There was a pause. I thought you would wish me to make regular payment to the Carters for your keep and your schooling. As you know, your father left you well provided for. Yes, of course, I would like that. I would like to pay my share. But Maya was not thinking of her money. She was thinking of the Amazon, of rivers full of leeches, of dark forests with hostile Indians with blowpipes and nameless insects which burrowed into flesh. How could she live there and give herself the courage? And to give herself courage, she said, um, what are they called? Who? The old man was still wondering about the arrangements he'd made with Mr Carter. Had he offered too much for Maya's keep? The twins, what are the name of the twins? Beatrice and Gwendolyn, said Emily, they've written you a note. And she handed Maya a single sheet of paper. Dear Maya, the girls had written, we hope you will come and live with us. We think it would be nice. Maya saw them as she read, fair and curly haired and pretty, everything she longed to be and wasn't. If they could live in the jungle, so could she. When do I go? she asked. At the end of next month, it's all worked out very well because the Carters have engaged a new governess and she'll travel out with you. Governess? In the jungle? How strange it all sounded, but the letter from the girls had given her heart. They were looking forward to having her. They wanted her. Surely it would be all right. Well, let's hope it's for the best, said Miss Banks after Maya left the room. They were more serious now. It was a long way to send a child to an unknown family, and there was Maya's music to consider. She played the piano well, but what interested the staff was Maya's voice. Her mother had been a singer. Maya's own voice was sweet and true. Though she did not want to sing professionally, her eagerness to learn new songs and understand them was exceptional. But what was it that was to set against the chance of a loving home? The Carters had seemed really pleased to take Maya, and she was an attractive child. The console had promised to keep me informed, said Mr Murray, and the meeting broke up. Meanwhile, Maya's return to the classroom meant the end of the tributaries of the Thames. The Thames, sorry. Tomorrow we will have our lesson on the Amazon and the rivers of South America, said Miss Carlyle. I want to you all to find out at least one interesting fact about it, she smiled at Maya. And I shall expect you to tell us how you will travel and for how long so that we can all share your adventure. There was no doubt about it. Maya was a heroine, but not the kind that people envied, more the kind that got burnt at the stake. By the time her friends had clustered around her with oohs and ahs and cries of distress, Maya wanted nothing except to run away and hide. But she didn't. She asked permission to go to the library after supper. The library at the academy was a good one. That night, Maya sat alone on top of the mahogany library steps and she read and she read and she read. She read about the great broad leaves Lead, leaved trees of the rainforest pierced by sudden rays of sun. She read about the travellers who had explored the maze of rivers and found a thousand plants and animals that had never been seen before. She read about brilliantly coloured birds flashing between the laden branches, macaws and hummingbirds and parakeets, and butterflies the size of saucers, and curtains of sweetly scented orchids trailing from the trees. She read about the wisdom of the Indians who could cure sickness and wounds that no one in Europe understood. Those who think of the Amazon as a green hell, she read in an old book with a tattered spine, bring only their own fears and 
prejudices to this amazing land. For whether a place is a hell or a heaven rests in yourself, and those who go with courage and an open mind may find themselves in paradise. Maya looked up from the book. I can do it, she vowed. I can make it a heaven and I will. Matron found her there long after bedtime, still perched on the ladder, but she didn't scold her, for there was a strange look on the girl's face, as though she was already in another country. Everyone came well prepared to the geography lesson on the following day. You start, Hermione, said Miss Carlyle. What did you find out about the Amazon? Um, Hermione looked anxiously at Maya. There are huge crocodiles in the rivers that can snap your head off in one bite. Only they're not called crocodiles. They're called alligators because their snouts are fatter, but they're just as fierce. And if you put one hand in the water, there are these piranhas that strip all the flesh off your bones. Every single bit. They look just like ordinary fish, but their teeth are terrible, said Melanie. Daisy offered a mosquito, which bit you and gave you yellow fever. You turn as yellow as a lemon and then you die, she said. And it's so hot, the sweat absolutely runs off you in buckets. Not sweat, dear, perspiration, corrected Miss Carlyle. Anna described the Indians, covered in terrifying swirls of paint, who shot you with poison arrows, which paralysed you and made you mad. From Rose came jaguars, silent as shadows, which pounced on anyone who dared to go into the forest. Miss Carlyle now raised her hand and looked worriedly at Maya. The girl was pale and silent, and she was very sorry now that she had told the class to find out what they could. And you, Maya, what did you find out? Maya rose to her feet. She'd written notes, but she didn't look at them. And when she began to speak, she held her head high, for the first time in the library had changed everything. The Amazon is the largest river in the world. The Nile is a little bit longer, but the Amazon has the most water. It used to be called the River Sea because of that. And all over Brazil, there are rivers that run into it. Some of the rivers are black and some are brown and the ones that run in it from the south are blue and this is because of what is under the water. When I go I should travel on a boat off the Booth line and I will take four weeks to go across the Atlantic and then when I get to Brazil I shall have to travel a thousand miles along the river between trees that lean over the water and there will be scarlet birds and sandbanks and creatures like big guinea pigs called capa, capa bearers which you can tame. And after a, another two weeks on the boat, I shall reach the city of Manaus, which is a beautiful place with a theatre with a green golden roof and shops and hotels, just like here, because the people who grew rubber out there became very rich, so they could build such a place even in the middle of the jungle. And that is where I shall be met by Mr and Mrs Carter and by Beatrice and Gwendolyn. She broke off and grinned at her classmates. And after that, I don't know, but it's going to be all right. But she needed all her courage as she stood in the hall a month later saying goodbye. Her trunk was corded, her travelling cape lay in the small suitcase which was all she was allowed to take into the cabin and she stood in a circle of her friends. Hermione was crying. The youngest pupil, Dora, was clutching her skirt. Don't go, Maya, she wailed. I don't want you to go. Who's going to tell me stories? We'll miss you, shrieked Melanie. Don't step on a boa constrictor. Right, oh please write lots and lots of letters. Last minute presents had been stuffed into her case, a slightly strange pincushion made by Anna, a set of ribbons for her hair. The teachers too had come up to see her off and the maids were coming upstairs. You'll be all right, miss, they said. You'll have a lovely time. But they looked at her with pity. Piranhas and alligators were in the air and the housemaid who had sat up most of the night with Maya after she heard of her parents' death was wiping the eyes, wiping her eyes with the corner of her apron. The headmistress now came down the stairs, followed by Miss Emily, and everyone made way for her as she came up to Maya. But the farewell speech Miss Banks had prepared was never made. Instead, she came forward and put her arms around Maya, who vanished for the last time into the folds of her tremendous bosom. Farewell, my child, she said, and God bless you. And then the porter came and the carriage was at the door. The girls followed Maya out into the street, but at the sight of the black-clad woman sitting stiffly in the back of the cab, her hands on her umbrella, Maya faltered. This was Miss Minton, the governess who was going to take care of her on the journey. Doesn't she look fierce? whispered Melanie. You, mumbled Hermione, and indeed the tall gaunt woman looked more like a rake or a nutcracker than a human being. The door of the cab opened, a hand in a black glove, bony and cold as a skeleton, was stretched out to help her in. Maya took it and followed by the shrieks of the schoolmates they set off. For the first part of the journey, Maya kept her eyes on the side of the road. Now that she was really leaving her friends, it was hard to hold back the tears. She'd reached the gulping stage when she heard a loud snapping noise and turned her head. 
Miss Minton had opened the metal clasp of her large black handbag and was handing a clean handkerchief embroidered with the initial A. Myself, said the governess in her deep breath voice, I would think how lucky I was, how fortunate. To go to the Amazon, you mean? To have so many friends who were sad to see me go. Didn't you have friends who minded you leaving? Miss Minton's thin lips twitched for a moment. My sister's budgerigar, perhaps, if he'd understood what was happening, which is extremely doubtful. Maya turned her head. Miss Minton was certainly a most extraordinary-looking person. Her eyes behind thick, dark-rimmed spectacles were the colour of mud. Her mouth was narrow, her nose thin and sharp, and her black felt hat was tethered to her sparse bun of her hair with a fearsome hat pin in the shape of a Viking spear. It's copied from the armour of Emic the Ham Eric the Hammerer, said Miss Minton, following Maya's gaze. One can kill with a hat pin like that. Both of them fell silent again, fell silent again till the cab lurched suddenly and Miss Minton's umbrella clattered to the floor. It was quite the largest and ugliest umbrella Maya had ever seen, with a steel spike and a large shaft ending in a handle shaped like a, the beak of a bird of prey. Miss Minton, however, was looking carefully at the crack in the handle which had been mended with glue. Did you break it before? Maya asked politely. Yes, she peered at the hideous umbrella through her thick glasses. I broke it on the back of a boy called Henry Hartington, she said. Maya shrank back. How? she began, but her mouth had gone dry. I threw him on the ground, knelt on him and belaboured him with my umbrella, said Miss Minton. Hard, for a long time. She leant back in her seat, looking almost happy. Maya swallowed. What had he done? He tried to stuff a small spaniel puppy through the wire mesh of his father's tennis court. Oh, was it her badly, the puppy? Yes. What happened to it? One leg was dislocated and his eye was scratched. The gardener managed to set the leg, but we couldn't do anything about his eye. How, how did Henry's mother punish him? She didn't. Oh dear, me no. I was dismissed instead, without a reference. Miss Minton turned <coughs> away. The year that followed, when she could not get another job, and had had to stay with her married sister, was one that she was not willing to remember or discuss. The cab stopped. They'd reached Euston Station. Miss Minton waved her umbrella at a porter, and Maya's trunk and her suitcase were lifted onto a trolley. Then came a battered tin trunk with the letters A. Minton painted on the side. "'You'll need two men for that,' said the governess. The porter looked offended. "'Not me, I'm strong.' But when he came to lift the trunk, he staggered. "'Crikey, ma'am, what have you got in there?' he asked. Miss Minton looked at him haughtily and did not answer. Then she led Maya into the platform where the train waited to take them to Liverpool and to the RMS Cardinal bound for Brazil. They were steaming out of the station before Maya was asked. Before Maya asked, was it in book was it books in the trunk? It was books, admitted Miss Minton, and Maya said, Good. So that's the end of chapter one. Quite a long chapter, isn't it? But I hope you can see why I love it so much. It just turns into the very best adventure and we will continue with chapter two tomorrow. Okay, have a good day and a good evening. Bye!